Welcome to section 7 of Psychiatry. In this discussion, we'll be discussing cognition, orientation, delirium, and amnesia. So let's get started. Let's start by defining cognition. Cognition is the process of understanding through thought and experience. Thought and experience include the following. Language, memory, reasoning, attention, and orientation. In other words, cognition is a general term that encompasses all of these ideas. Your ability to speak and use your language and remember things, accessing your memory, and ability to concentrate and attend are all part of your daily cognitive functions. And orientation is simply knowing who you are and where you are. Being oriented to time is also important. So if you don't know the year, then you're disoriented to time. And the term neurocognitive disorders is an umbrella term that encompasses diseases when these cognitive functions are messed up. And when these cognitive functions are messed up, the patient can have delirium or dementia. We will talk about delirium more in this lecture, especially how to distinguish delirium from dementia. Before that, though, it's possible that someone can have just a loss of memory and their other functions remain intact. So in other words, they have language, reasoning, attention, and orientation, but they're lacking memory. That would be amnesia. Let's dive into amnesia now. Amnesia is classified as either retrograde amnesia or anterograde amnesia. In retrograde amnesia, you can make new memories, but you're unable to remember anything prior to the CNS insult. A useful mnemonic for this is that retrograde starts with the letters R and E, and R and E is found at the end of before. So with retrograde amnesia, they can't remember anything before the CNS insult. Now let's talk about anterograde amnesia. With this type of amnesia, the patient can remember everything before the CNS insult, but they can't form new memories after. So A in after and anterograde. So in anterograde amnesia, what's the problem? It's everything after the CNS issue. With retrograde amnesia, what's the problem? It's everything before the injury. A specific type of amnesia is Korsakoff syndrome. And here's the basic pathophysiology. Basically, a patient has alcoholism. They drink almost exclusively alcohol. And since they don't get any other nutrients in their body, they are deficient in thiamine or vitamin B1. And this vitamin deficiency can lead to Wernicke encephalopathy. This is an acute condition. And recurrent bouts of Wernicke encephalopathy can lead to mammillary body destruction and Korsakoff syndrome. So you can think of Korsakoff syndrome as the chronic version of Wernicke encephalopathy. An associated finding with Korsakoff syndrome is a destruction of the mammillary bodies, which you can see on this diagram right here. They're part of the limbic system. And mammillary bodies are important for memory. Now let's talk about symptoms. Korsakoff syndrome is typically characterized by anterograde amnesia, although retrograde amnesia is also possible. Another common symptom is confabulations. Confabulations are fabricated or erroneous or distorted memories created with no intention to deceive. Basically, patients make things up because they can no longer remember what actually happened. For example, someone with Korsakoff syndrome may tell you they traveled to France this summer, though they've never been there, because they can't remember what they did last summer. They're not trying to deceive you, they're just kind of confabulating. Now let's talk about delirium. Delirium is an acute and reversible loss of cognitive function. Remember, cognitive functions include language, memory, reasoning, attention, and orientation. So these delirious patients don't know where they are, so they can be disoriented. They can't attend or concentrate on those around them. They are unreasonable or illogical. They're often unintelligible, so their language isn't really working and they almost always struggle to remember anything. And delirium can also have a waxing and waning pattern. For example, you can see a patient return to baseline. They're totally normal, all their cognitive functions are working, but then they just revert to that delirious state again. That's a waxing and waning pattern. And delirium can take on a hyperactive form. In this form, they're usually agitated, or it can be a hypoactive form where they're really sluggish. So on one end, they can just be really slow and basically asleep, or they can be throwing things around the room and threatening to hurt you. Lastly, psychotic features are common to delirium. For example, they can have delusions and hallucinations. Now, delirium can look a lot like dementia, so it's very important to distinguish these two. With that in mind, let's give a brief overview of dementia. There are many causes of dementia which are best covered with neuropathology, but here's what you need to know when it comes to psychiatry. Dementia is a decline in cognitive function. It's chronic, it's irreversible, and it's progressive. And that's in stark contrast to delirium, because delirium is acute, 
not chronic, it's reversible, and it waxes and wanes, it's not progressive. And it's important to distinguish delirium from dementia because your approach to treatment will be very different. For example, if you identify that a patient is delirious, you're going to want to know what caused it, because then you can fix that. Which brings me to my next point. You want to be able to know how to treat them. So let's discuss that now. When it comes to delirium, there are many causes, and the pathophysiology is really not well understood. So although we don't know exactly why these issues cause delirium, we still know that they do, and so we want to be on the lookout for them. For example, you want to know what medications the patient's taking. For example, is the elderly patient taking things like benzodiazepines or anticholinergics? Do they have an infection, like a UTI that you haven't diagnosed yet? Are they staying at the hospital overnight? Have they experienced any trauma or organ dysfunction of any kind? When it comes to treatment, your goal is to just fix the underlying problem. So if you diagnose your patient with delirium, think, okay, which one of these things caused the delirium? For example, go through their medications and see if one of those may be messing them up. Or you might be looking for an underlying infection that you weren't aware of, like a UTI. And then you just want to think logically about their organs. Are they all working? Is there anything you should be on the lookout for? So that's the goal of treatment. Fix the underlying problem. While you're doing that, you want to help maintain their sleep-wake cycle. So open the blinds during the daytime. Don't let them keep them closed. It's just going to mess them up more. In fact, sometimes doing that alone can reverse the delirium. And as part of keeping the patient safe, you may need to use antipsychotics. And again, that's only if safety is a serious issue. And that includes safety to the patient and safety to the staff of the hospital. And remember that delirium can cause psychotic features. And delirium can come in a hyperactive form or a hypoactive form. And in the case of a hyperactive delirious patient with psychotic features such as hallucinations, it's easy to see why safety might become an issue. But even if it does become an issue, don't be mistaken. Antipsychotics are not treating the patient. They're just keeping them safe while you're treating them. The treatment being fixing the underlying problem. A 73-year-old woman is recovering in a hospital room on day two following an abdominal surgery. The physician began asking her questions and found that the patient knew her name, but didn't know the year or the name of the city. The remainder of the interview was difficult because the patient was very slow to respond and needed to be prompted multiple times before a question was answered. What information is required to tell if this patient has dementia or delirium? Hopefully from the question stem, you could tell this patient had problems with cognition. For example, she didn't know the year or the name of the city. That indicates disorientation. She also had trouble keeping her attention on the physician and what was being asked. After all, she needed to be prompted multiple times. That indicates a loss of attention. She couldn't attend. So we've identified two cognitive functions that aren't functioning. With just that information, this could be dementia or delirium. What do we need to know to distinguish the two? Well, remember that delirium is acute, it's reversible, and it waxes and wanes. So in order to determine if this patient has delirium versus dementia, we need to know when these symptoms started. For example, has she been acting this way for years? If so, that indicates dementia. But if these conditions presented only after her abdominal surgery, then we're thinking delirium. So the biggest thing that we need to know right now about her history is the onset. And if you figure this one thing out, then you'll pretty much have your answer. You can think, oh, this just came on suddenly. It's acute. Then you can anticipate it being reversible, and you can anticipate a waxing and waiting pattern. So again, what information do you need? You need to know the onset. And that concludes this section.